There we go. Awesome. Uh, good evening and welcome to a, another Rashu Christi live stream. My name is Karnu van Yerden uh, and I am with uh, Rashu Christi. Um, and just before we begin, uh, just to have for those who are viewing tonight, uh, just a, you know, explanation of who we are and what we do as a ministry, Rashu Christi, which is Latin for reason for Christ, is an international campus uh, apologetic ministry and so basically uh, apologetics apologia in 1 peter 3 verse 15 16 we seek to give answers for the hope and reasons for the hope that was in in is in in us and so uh and so yeah and basically we, we is summarizing what we do on one side uh we seek to serve the church and fellow believers um if people have questions about uh, christianity um, like of Christians, helping them to answer those questions, helping them to have a deeper understanding of their own faith, basically what they believe and why they believe it as well. And on the uh, other side as well, we seek to create an open platform for um, uh, people who are not Christians, who have questions uh, regarding Christianity, questions and objections. And so, and so, yeah, and uh, if you've wa been watching us on YouTube and you're familiar with Russia Christie, you know that no topic is too controversial. We seek to engage in multiple, multiple fields, science, philosophy, politics, economics, you name it, and, and to give a sort of like Christian understanding and, you know, you know deeper study and stuff like that uh, regarding these important uh, topics in our society. And so, and so yeah, um, and I also want to in, uh, encourage you all, um, uh, with Rashu Christi, we are a non-profit uh, organization. If you wish to help us in our ministry and really help us keep, uh, keep us doing what we're doing, because, uh, yeah, um, we would uh, really appreciate it if you would um, also uh, make a donation. Uh, there is a link in the description below, but you can also directly go to our website at rashukristi.co.za. Uh, where you can uh, make, a, make a donation. Also, if you are interested in resources, or you, you name it, articles, we post articles weekly on different topics, um, please also uh, visit our website, rashukristi.co.za. We have a bunch of cool stuff already posted there and a lot of cool stuff still coming. And so, yeah, and, and, and lastly, also, um, uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, you know, click the notification bell uh, to, <laughs> to get notified with all our latest streams and videos coming out. But also, um, I encourage you all also, if you uh, uh, encourage you to subscribe to our, our on our website, um, to our newsletter, to keep up to date with uh, what we are doing in the field and stuff like that. Because some of the stuff we do as a ministry might not always be uh, displayed on the YouTube channel and maybe on some of the uh, other platforms we work on. But if, uh, if you want to keep up with what we're doing and the other projects we're working on and uh, stuff like that, please subscribe to our newsletter on the website uh, as well. So yeah, um, so let's kick off tonight. Yeah, tonight we are going to do a very uh, interesting and also in many circles controversial topic. You know, at Rasha Christi, we do not shy away from controversy at all. We run right at it. <laughs> and so uh, tonight we will have, be having an introduction to natural theology and our speaker, Dr. David Haynes, will be uh, leading us tonight. And um, yeah, so just quickly on uh, uh, Dr. Haynes, Dr. David Haynes um, uh, lives with his wife and their four children in Quebec. Um, he is Associate Professor of Philosophy and Religion at Veritas International uh, University. 
He is, um, <clears throat> and he is also taught history of Christian apologetics at the FTE Acadia. He is also the founding president of Association Axiom and Association of French Evangelical Scholars and the Christian Philosophy and Apologetics Center. He has published a number of articles on natural theology and co-authored a book on natural law. His academic research focuses on ancient and medieval metaphysics, uh, C.S. Uh, Lewis, Thomism, and natural theology. So, yeah, and also with the book I, ha I have here, this is a bit of product placement. Uh, his book here with uh, uh, Andrew A. Fulford, Natural Law, and a uh, brief introduction to biblical defense. Awesome book. I highly recommend this. Okay. And so, and so yeah, that, that's it. And so, David, if you have anything to add, um, uh, please, yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, I suppose I could add that uh, my wife and I, we live in Quebec. We're, we've almost uh, made it to winter. Uh, we have uh, a mini hobby farm, which in Canada anyways implies that we have goats. Uh, we have uh, some chickens as well and some quail. And uh, we uh, enjoy raising those and eating the, the eggs from the, uh, the chicken. Uh, also more recently, uh, I've been teaching with the University of Sherbrooke up here in Quebec and uh, Davenant Hall as well. Uh, all right, so uh, let's get started. Uh, I'm gonna turn the share screen on. All right. So uh, I'm going to premise the entire presentation uh, with, uh, by pointing out that this is an introduction to natural theology. Uh, what I say on almost each section uh, or subsection or sub subsection could probably be elaborated uh, and turned into an entire presentation in itself. Uh, uh, as such, uh, I will not be able to get into too many uh, extremely uh, interesting or, or overly profound details, but you know we'll do what we can. So first of all, uh, as an introduction to natural theology, uh, this is what, basically what I want to go through as much as, as well as I can within the, in the hour that we have. Uh, first of all, what is natural theology? Uh, secondly, I want to look at the biblical support for natural theology, do a uh, sprint uh, through the history of, uh, of thought, uh, about what natural about, uh, in natural theology, and then look at some objections to natural theology. Uh, so let's start with what is natural theology. Uh, so the word theology comes from two Greek words, uh, theos and logos. Now, theos uh, means God. The word logos is a bit more complicated, and it, its meaning can, of course, depend on the con on the on the uh, context in which it's being used. Uh, Joseph Owens, in his book, The Doctrine of Being in Aristotelian Metaphysics, says that logos, at least in Aristotle, uh, again, depending on the context, can mean a uh, word, language, or speech, uh, notion, or thought. Uh, it may also mean the faculty of thinking or reasoning, and it can even mean mathematical proportions or relations. So you really have to let the, the context help you understand what the word logos means. In general, however, when we talk about theology, or, or and put those two words together, we are really talking about a dialogue, a discussion, uh, an organization of truth claims about God. Now, clearly, uh, Christianity does not have uh, the corner on theology. When we talk about theology, we always have to be more precise. What theology are we talking about? You know, we could talk about Hindu theology, we can talk about Greek and Roman theology, and in fact, uh, in the context of, of much Greek philosophy, the theology that was in question was often Greek, theo Greek gods and Greek theology. Um, speaking historically, the term natural theology uh, is found perhaps for the first time uh, in uh, the works of Augustine, perhaps in Vero, uh, though we, we find in Augustine's City of God uh, an explanation of Vero's uh, distinction of types of theology. And, and Augustine then, he'll say something along the following lines, after having quoted Vero about how uh, physical theology, which is the what, what uh, Vero called it, is this philosophical discussion about the gods, uh, Augustine then comments uh, that this second kind, which Vero called physical theology, the second kind should be called natural, uh, the custom of speech now admits. So we find Augustine referring to the philosophical discussion about God or the gods. He refers to that as natural theology. 
And this is really where, to a certain extent, the, the term first comes up in the history of, of human thought, uh, at least in, a, in, a, in, in Christian thought. Uh, after that, we, we see different philosophers that, that uh, take the term natural theology or metaphysics. Uh, and uh, and I, I don't have a lot of time to get into this, but in Aristotle's metaphysics, he, he, will de he will describe metaphysics under a number of different terms. One of them is first philosophy or science. The other is wisdom. And then the other is theology. And these three terms all refer essentially to the same science, uh, and, uh, as far, at least as far as Giovanni Reel is concerned. Um, and so we have theology is a philosophical discussion about the gods or about God. It has become a popular term uh, for this approach uh, to theology. Now, uh, I'm going to give a definition here that I tend to use uh, for natural theology. Uh, broadly defined, uh, as you can see here, is that part of philosophy which explores that which man can know about God his existence, his divine nature, etc., from nature alone, uh, via man's divinely bestowed faculty of reason, and this unaided by any divinely inspired written revelation from any religion, uh, and this without presupposing the truth of any one religion. Again, we could really trim this down to just say natural theology is a philosophical discussion about God. So that's, what the that's what natural theology is. Let's look at what it is not. It's important to distinguish between what philosophy is and what it is not, because many of the, the uh, objections to natural philosophy, uh, natural theology, at least from within Christian circles, often comes from a misunderstanding of what natural theology actually is or purports to do. So uh, we distinguish natural theology from natural revelation. Natural revelation, we can be described as this way, natural revelation is to natural theology as the Christian scriptures are to biblical theology. In other words, it's the, it's the, it's the matter that theology is working with. It, we, are, we are going to natural revelation. We are discovering things in natural revelation about God in the same way that biblical theology will go to the scriptures and discover things about God from the scriptures. Uh, to quote uh, John Calvin, Natural revelation is, uh, this, I'm not quoting quite yet, natural revelation is what God does when he manifests, and I quote, his perfections in the whole structure of the universe, and so manifests himself daily uh, in our view that we cannot open our eyes without being compelled to behold him. Uh, there's an interesting quote here. Uh, he says, I just wanted, the full quote is, I just wanted to note here that there is a way to seek God that is common to pagans and to believers of the church by following in his footsteps as they are outlined in the heavens and on earth as paintings of his image. That's from the Institutes of Christian Religion, uh, Tome 1, Chapter 5, Section 6. Um, all right. So natural revelation could be portrayed as the traces or the footsteps of God as they are seen by all men. Here, Calvin says this is common to pagans and believers. Uh, in the French version, it says it's, it is a common way uh, to both pagans and believers uh, to, to search God and, in fact, to find him. So natural revelation is the material with which natural theology works, it, just as the Bible is the material with which biblical theology works. Uh, another way in which uh, natural revelation or the relationship between natural revelation and, and the scriptures had been described in the history of Christian thought is as the two books in which God reveals himself. So we have the book of nature and the book of scriptures, and God reveals himself in both. We find that not only do we find that uh, image of, uh, illustrating the relationship between natural revelation and special revelation, not only do we find it in a number of Christian theologians in the Middle Ages, uh, we also find it uh, in one of the three uh, uh, foundations of, or three sources of unity for the Reformed churches, that is the Belgian Confession. The Belgian Confession also refers to the two books in which God reveals himself, the book of nature in the book of scripture. Another analogy, which I personally find helpful to explain uh, what just what's going on 
in with natural theology and and natural revelation and then you know the scriptures and biblical theology is the following let's see here there we go so we have here some pictures uh that for most people will be immediately recognizable uh, we have the Mona Lisa and the uh, Last Supper, both of whom were painted by Leonardo da Vinci. Now, it is commonly known that Leonardo da Vinci never signed any of his works. However, uh, today his works are not only amongst the most well-known of the Renaissance paintings, but they were also in fact quite revolutionary for his time. Now, let's say that a young man uh, who has been brought up in our contemporary system of education is walking down the street. He clearly has never heard anything of Leonardo da Vinci, otherwise, unless maybe he watched that, you know, fairly contemporary movie, uh, The Da Vinci Code. But I mean, if he hasn't seen that movie, he's never heard of anything about Leonardo da Vinci. He doesn't know anything about these paintings. And he's walking down the street and um, clearly lost, walks into a used bookstore and sees in front of his eyes, one of these beautiful paintings. Clear, as in the past, for those who have seen these paintings, he is immediately captivated uh, by these images. And he, he, he looks at them and, and, and finds them interesting. And he searches everywhere to find out who painted them. Of course, as we know, Leonardo da Vinci does not sign his paintings. So clearly, our young man finding uh, no signature on any of the paintings that he has before his face he immediately infers that there was in fact no painter, walks out of the store amazed at just how incredible it was that these paintings could come about by pure accident. Some elaborate form of uh, chaos and chance. Of course not. That's not, that's, he would never react that way. Not knowing who, who painted these, not finding the signature of the painter anywhere, anywhere he would hopefully having some sort of curiosity, turn to the owner of the bookshop and say, who did these? Who, who, is the, who is the artist of these magnificent paintings? And hopefully the, paint, the owner of the bookshop would then be able to explain to him that it was Leonardo da Vinci. When he sees the paintings, though he knows nothing about the identity of the painter, he doesn't know who painted these paintings. He does know that there was in fact an artist. And he can even perhaps learn something about the artist from the paintings, though he may not from the paintings know who the artist was. In order to know who the artist of these paintings was, you actually have to go into literature. You have to maybe, you, uh, you would have to be informed either by the artist himself or by someone who knows about the history of these paintings who painted them. And you can, of course, find that in a biography of some, or, or, or something about Leonardo da Vinci, which brings me to this next point, post here. Here we have a picture of uh, Leonardo da Vinci. It's, it's apparently his um, self-portrait. And we have a book uh, about Leonardo da Vinci, giving a biography of the artist. And so by looking at this biography, by a little bit of education, we are able to come to recognize not only that there is an artist for these paintings, which we can learn just by looking at them, but also we can understand who the artist was. We come to get an idea of the identity of the artist. Coming back to natural revelation and natural theology and then, and then biblical revel, uh, revelation and, and biblical theology, the traditional acclaim of Christian theology has been that through natural revelation, all men are able to recognize that there is a creator of the sensible cosmos. But Christian theology has also traditionally claimed that they cannot thus know anything about who that artist is. So they don't know the identity, only that he exists. In fact, Christian theology typically claims that in order to discover uh, that Jesus is God, uh, that God is triune, that Jesus uh, became incarnate and so on and so forth, you must turn to special revelation in order to discover that. So natural revelation is the materials with which natural theology works. Scriptural or biblical revelation is the materials with which biblical theology works. And then if we went a bit further, usually those bo both those two elements, natural theology plus biblical theology, are often combined into uh, systematic 
theology, along with often a historical theology, dogmatic, and so on. Uh, natural theology, uh, uh, defined as I've given it above, is also not technically coextensive with something that's called natural religion. So I, I mentioned that above here. It is also not natural religion. Now, natural religion is something of a, a historical phenomenon, and that is uh, around the modern period, a, a number of theologians and philosophers began referring to what we call natural theology as natural religion. The reason why I would suggest that it is not the same thing is that, uh, at, at least today anyways, what we mean by natural religion seems to be contradictory or in opposition to Christian religion. So we would, it's better to distinguish between natural theology and the attempt to form some sort of natural religion, which many modern deists did. Finally, uh, the third point here, uh, natural theology is not uh, coextensive with Christian apologetics. That seems, may, may seem like a, a strange claim because many people who do Christian apologetics use natural theology. But if we stick with what the Christian tradition has typically taught, they are not coextensive. That is, natural theology is not the claim that all of the truths of Christianity can be proved via human reasoning without the aid of divinely inspired scriptures. Rather, uh, natural theology, uh, as, we as we have defined it in this presentation, uh, doesn't venture to say anything about those truths of the Christian religion, which are only known through special revelation. It is simply the philosophical study of what can be naturally known about God without recourse to special revelation. It can be used in Christian the apologetics where it overlaps with uh, some of the truth claims of the Christian religion. Uh, and so it is very helpful in demonstrating and trad has traditionally been used in this way to demonstrate the existence of one God and as well as the attributes of that God. Uh, there's perhaps one more comment I would make in passing. When we talk about natural knowledge, one of the things we're also talking about is knowledge, which is naturally known. And I don't have time to get into all the details on what it, what we what we mean by natural knowledge, but we are we often we have more natural knowledge, and natural knowledge is more um, useful in uh, Christian theology than we often suspect. Uh, a number of things that would fit under uh, the rubric of natural knowledge would include uh, not only uh, the insights of the various uh, natural sciences biology and, and zoology and so on, and how they can come and help us to understand the scriptures, but also archaeological studies. Uh, natural knowledge is, is, could be essentially be defined as anything that we know or come to understand, which is not explicitly revealed in the scriptures. Uh, and in fact, one of the things that I've argued for in an article I wrote a couple of years ago was that without a certain amount of natural knowledge, you actually can't even properly interpret scriptures. We uh, take for granted, you might say we presuppose, natural knowledge when we read and interpret scriptures. All right, so we'll say that in passing. Biblical support for natural theology. Now, I only have time to briefly give an overview of some of these things. Um, however, as you go through uh, the history of Christian thought and you look at the, the way in which Christian theologians have typically uh, supported the, no the notion of natural theology, uh, one of the things that we discover is that they almost always refer to a certain number of verses in the scriptures. The most common verses are Psalm 119, verse 1 to 4, which I have here on the screen, Acts 14, uh, verses 15 to 17, Acts 17, verses 26 to 27 specifically, but also the entire arrow pages speech, uh, Romans chapter 1, 19 to 20, and, uh, and uh, uh, also Romans chapter 2, 14 to 15. On occasion, with some of the medieval authors, we will also see them referring to uh, some other uh, books, such as Wisdom. It, these verses are used, for anyone who's interested in doing the historical research, these verses are often used as proof texts in the Reformed uh, confessions, such as the Belgian Confession, the French Confession of Faith, the Westminster Confession, uh, uh, the... Sign out of Dort, 
uh, and the L London Baptist Confession of 1689, these verses are often supplied as proof texts for the claim that something about God, his existence and power, for example, can be known from nature. So let's briefly discuss some of these verses. Psalm 19, 1 to 4. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech. There are no words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Uh, these verses have been traditionally taken to articulate the point that the entire created cosmos is speaking to mankind and telling us humans we were created. Uh, when you actually go through the, uh, the history, for example, of the interpretation of these verses, uh, it's very interesting to, for example, take a look at how Gregory of Nyssa, uh, in a letter to Enomius, will interpret these verses, for example. He, he, he's trying to refute a heresy in, related, in relation to the interpretation of, of some verses in Genesis, and in order to clarify what he's saying about these verses, he actually draws us to Psalm 119. And so he says, look, in Psalm 19, it says the whole universe proclaims that God exists. But clearly, this is an analogy. And so his point is, that the, the, the psalmist is, is not using literal language here. He's using some sort of imagery to help us get a point across. And then Gregory of Nisa, he elaborates. He says, what's going on here? He says, well, when we question the universe, when we, when we look to the cosmos and we ask, you know, where did you come from? The universe unanimously replies... God made us. Well, Gregory of Nyssa is not the only one to interpret the scriptures, these verses, this way. Augustine does exactly the same thing in one of his most well-known works, the Confessions. And in the Confessions, uh, prior to his conversion experience, he discusses how through the sensible cosmos, he was brought to love God. This is prior to his conversion experience, which is at the end of the next book, but he, in the Confessions. And, and he, he talks about through this experience of, of seeing the sensible cosmos uh, uh, returning in towards himself and then moving upwards towards God, this form of uh, almost a Plotinian ascent, uh, as we, we will find in the Enneads of, of Plotinus. Uh, he discovers through the creation that God exists. And then a little bit later, we, we find another passage, which is essentially the same as what Gregory says. And so he says, uh, he, Augustine says, I then turned to the cosmos and said, are you the God that I have loved? And the cosmos replied, no, we were created by him. And then he turns to another part of the cosmos, perhaps the seas or the trees or the mountains. And he says, are you the God that I have loved? Because referring back to how he, he loved, he, he discovered that he loved God through the sensible cosmos. And the cosmos again replied, no, we were created by him. And Augustine says, referring to these verses in Psalm 19, that the sensible cosmos unanimously proclaim to he who asks, we were created by God. Well, they're not the only ones. I could mention Calvin. John Calvin. Uh, this is from... Uh, his uh, commentary on the Psalms. He says this, referring to these verses. David shows how it is that the heavens proclaim to us the glory of God, namely by openly bearing testimony that they have not been put together by chance, but were wonderfully created by the supreme architect. When we behold the heavens, we cannot but be elevated by the contemplation of them to him who is their great creator. And the beautiful arrangement and the wonderful variety which, dis which distinguish the courses and station of the heavenly bodies, together with the beauty and splendor which are manifest in them, cannot but furnish us with an evident proof of his providence. Scripture, indeed, makes known to us the time and manner of the creation, but the heavens themselves, although God should say nothing on the subject, proclaim loudly and distinctly enough that they have been fashioned by his hands. And this of itself abundantly suffices to bear testimony to men of his glory. As soon as we acknowledge God to be the supreme architect who has erected the beauteous uh, fabric of the universe, our minds must necessarily be ravished with wonder at his infinite goodness, wisdom, and power. This is from his commentary on these verses, Psalms 19, 1 to 4. 
We could, of course, go on, but uh, you know we're limited in time, so we'll go to the next uh, verse here. Acts chapter 14, uh, verses 15 to 17. Here we read this. Uh, I should give that maybe perhaps, perhaps the, the context. Uh, Paul and uh, Barnabas have just healed a lame man at Lystra, uh, and they, they, to whom they had been preaching the gospel. The, the people of Lystra are absolutely flabbergasted. This is amazing. They've never seen this before. And they uh, conclude the gods are amongst us. And then, so they want to worship Paul and Barnabas. Uh, Barnabas got the, um, the bad rap, I guess. Or, sorry, Paul got the bad rap. He was just uh, Hermes. Um, Barnabas was Zeus. Either way, uh, they reply to the people of Lystra with the following words. Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you. And we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness. For he did good by you, by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Now, for someone who's not perhaps studied philosophy, but has studied the scriptures, one immediately is drawn from these verses back to Psalm 19, 1 to 4. We have a witness, a testimony. What is that testimony to the existence of God? The heavens. And here Paul is very precise. Uh, he gave you rain from heavens, fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. But for someone who studied the history of philosophy, specifically ancient philosophy, uh, we cannot help but think of Cicero. Cicero presents almost the exact same argument in his work, De Natura Deorum, of the nature of the gods. And so we have here an argument based upon the ordering of the seasons and the, the, the way in which the world functions to demonstrate the existence of a God who is both creator and providential, providentially sovereign over the entire cosmos. F.F. F. Bruce uh, notes uh, something that is, is, is quite obvious for him in Acts chapter 17. He says, to Jews who already know that God is one and that he is the living and true God, the gospel proclaims that Jesus is the Christ. But pagans must first be taught what Jews already confess regarding the unity and character of God. And this is what Paul is doing here. Uh, John Calvin, in his commentary on these verses, Acts chapter uh, Acts chapter. Um, 14, he says this, seeing that Paul and Barnabas spake to the gentles, Gentiles, they should have in vain essayed to bring them unto Christ. Therefore, it was expedient for them to begin with some other point, which was not so far separate from common sense or, or perception, that after that was confessed they might afterward pass over to Christ. The minds of the men of Lystra were possessed with that error, that there be more gods than one. Paul and Barnabas show, on the contrary, that there is but one creator of the world. So they begin in these verses by turning the people of Lystra towards the existence of one, only, only one God rather than a multitude of gods. There, there is, again, more that I could say on these verses, but we will, we will move on. I have one more verse I want to look at. It's probably the most uh, common verse that's used in these discussions. Uh, Romans chapter 1, 19 to 20. Here we read, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So, they are without excuse. Now, some may think that the interpretation of these verses is evident. Uh, and in fact, throughout the history of Christianity, the interpretation of these verses has been fairly straightforward. Uh, however, uh, in more recent times, uh, there have been some con uh, con uh, variant uh, interpretations. The most recent theologian to propose it, uh, when I say most recent, one of the most recent theologians to propose a different interpretation of these verses would be Cornelius Van Til. Uh, for Van Til, the rejection of the knowledge of God to which Romans 1, 18, 21 refers, uh, appear, seems to happen during the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. 
Now I could give some quotes here from his introduction to systematic theology or other works. It's, it would be interesting, however, to take a look at what John Calvin says on Romans 1, 19 to 20. If we're going to use authorities for a reformed interpretation of scripture, uh, it, it would be quite interesting to see what John Calvin himself says. For John Calvin, these verses apply to all mankind and are true of all men, regenerate and unregenerate of all time. John Calvin says, for example, in his commentary, when he, talking about uh, Paul, when he says that God made it, his own existence, power, and eternal nature manifest to them, the meaning is that mankind was created to this end, that he be the contemplator of this excellent work, the world, that his eyes were given to him in order that seeing such a beautiful image, he would be brought to know the author himself that made it. Calvin goes on to say, that but he, humankind, does not deduce by himself all the things that can be concerned, considered in God, but he shows that we come to know his power and eternal divinity. For it is of necessity that he who is the author of all things be without beginning and consist of himself. One final quote from the commentary on Romans uh, will be quite interesting for, for Calvin's perspective here. He says, commenting on because they knew God. He says, he declares here quite obviously that God made a knowledge of his majesty flow, not the French word in the, the, the French uh, uh, commentaries is découler. Uh, the best translation I can figure is flow. His majesty flow down into the spirits of all men, which is to say that he has shown himself so much by his works that they are forced to see that which they do not seek by themselves. That is that there is a God. Other commentaries, in fact, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't have time to go into all the details here, but in fact, what's interesting about Romans chapter 1, 19 to 20 is that the traditional approach to interpretation of these, these passages, and I could list basically every single theologian through church history, is that these verses teach that all men, regenerate and unregenerate, uh, are able to have knowledge of God. Now, there are discussions that we can have about what type of knowledge, how. Is it an immediate knowledge? For example, they see the creation and without uh, a, an elaborate argument, they're able to infer the existence of a creator in the same way that when I see a painting, I immediately infer that there's an artist. Is it that type of a knowledge? Or is it more of a, a, a platonic or neoplatonic sense uh, in which we, we have an innate knowledge of, of, a, of the creator? Uh, both of these approaches have been proposed uh, throughout the history of, of Christian theology. Uh, and, and both of these approaches are, have been used in natural theology to demonstrate the existence of God. There are, of course, more verses uh, that we could look at. Uh, Romans uh, chapter 2, uh, Romans 1, verse, 3, uh, verse 32 is also interesting as well. well. One of the things that we can at least, some of the things we can conclude anyways uh, from these verses are that the church, both pre-reform and during the reform and post-reform, has traditionally taught that there is a solid biblical foundation for the claims of the doctrine of natural theology. One, the divine nature is revealed through creation. Secondly, human consideration of the sensible world leads sooner or later to some knowledge of the divine nature. And third, this knowledge is not sufficient to save the individual person from the righteous wrath of God. Uh, another comment we might make here, uh, most, many Christian theologians, as they're commenting on these verses, especially when they get to the section, so they are without excuse, uh, they will often, uh, I can think, I, I think, for example, of Peter Martyr Vermigli, uh, an early Reformed theologian, they often make the comment, the purpose of natural revelation, the, rev the manifestation of the existence and, and attributes of God in creation, the purpose is not primarily to condemn men, but rather that they may know God. That's the purpose. That's why God reveals himself, so that we may know him. The consequence of our rejection of God is that we are without excuse, because God has clearly revealed himself. All right. A rapid sprint uh, through history. Uh, if we look at the history of Christian, uh, sorry, of philosophy in general, we see uh, some interesting points. For the, you notice the first three points I put there. Uh, 
pre-Socratic, Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, and then, sorry, number four, Cicero as well. Uh, in these four uh, people, uh, we have uh, some philosophers who had no, as far as we know anyways, and as far as history reveals, we, they had no contact with biblical or scriptural uh, revelation. And yet, what's interesting is that as we go through their writings, the pre-Socratics, who we often say are the first philosophers, or the, the first people who really turn towards philosophy, they often embrace, based upon observation from scripture, the divine. Now, we wouldn't want to go so far as to say that they, they, they embrace something resembling the Christian God uh, in any way, shape, or form. However, what they, what they say is, or the description that they, they give of the divine often uh, resembles certain attributes of God. Uh, and so in some cases, it will be uh, intellect, which is the, the cause of the entire universe. They frequently talk about divine providence. That's the pre-Socratics. When we move to Plato, it become, and Socrates and Plato, it becomes more explicit. Uh, and there is some debate on the subject. I mean, this, in fact, this could be an, an entire course, uh, the question of uh, the Timaeus in Plato and the role of the Demiurge in relationship with, for example, the good in the Republic or, or noose in other books. Uh, however, uh, one thing that's interesting is that when you look at the Neoplatonic uh, thinkers, I put them at number six, they often interpret Plato in, with, in reference to the Demiurge and the good as referring to uh, God and will explicitly say as much. So in the Timaeus, uh, one thing that's interesting about, and I, and I want to take a sec section on this, one thing that's interesting with the Timaeus, just before Plato give, or gives his creation myth, which, uh, and I should, a quick parenthesis, for Plato, a myth is not, as we often portray it today, a fictional story. For Plato, a myth is a probable series of events, or at least a possible series of events, which would explain something. So it might not be exact, but it's a possible way of explaining them. And so he provides a creation myth. This is the best I can think of, of how God would have created the universe, or we might say the Demiurge created the universe. Prior to giving the creation myth, Plato has Timaeus present a couple principles. And one of the principles is everything that comes to be must have necessity come to be by the agency of some cause, for it is impossible for anything to come to be without a cause. Once that principle has been proposed, we then have the reason to provide a creation myth. And in fact, Timaeus will suggest, so the sensible universe came into being. We know, therefore, that it was created. Now, it's going to be difficult to talk about this creator. I'm not sure how exactly we'll describe him or if we'll be able to at all. But I'll try to explain how he could have brought the sensible universe into existence. Uh, we also find arguments in the laws in which he talks about the existence of God. Aristotle in the metaphys metaphysics, it becomes even more explicit, the existence of the first mover. Uh, I'll give a quick ex example here. Uh, Aristotle uh, describes God as a mover, I quote here, a mover which moves without being moved, being eternal, uh, subsistence, or, and actuality. Right? By subsistence, we mean, of course, existing essence. He then goes on to say, uh, if God is always in that good state in which we sometimes are, this compels our wonder. And if in a better, this compels it yet more. And God is in a better state. And life also belongs to God, for the actuality of thought is life, and God is that actuality. And God's essential actuality is life most good and eternal. We say, therefore, that God is a living being, eternal, most good, so that life and duration, continuous and eternal, belong to God, for this is God. He then goes on to describe God as a substance which is eternal and unmovable and separate from sensible things. He says, it has been shown also that this substance cannot have any magnitude, but is without parts and indivisible. For it produces movement through infinite time, but nothing finite has infinite power. It is also clear that it is impassable and unalterable. 
So, uh, you know, many of these descriptions that we provide of God in, in, in Aristotle uh, would, would have been uh, would basically adopted by Christian theologians as saying, well, yeah, that's exactly what we mean when we talk about the God of Christianity. And as I said, uh, uh, with Plato, there's some debate about is the Demiurge God? Well, there's also some debate about, you know, the first mover, uh, is this God? Um, in the literature on the subject, uh, mo uh, there, there is a bit of debate. Some, of the some will say that it is, some will say it isn't. And I don't really have time to get into that right now. Uh, all right, Cicero, another one that's interesting. Uh, uh, he also discusses the existence of God in his work on the, natures of the nature of the gods and provides a, a number of different arguments to demonstrate that the divine exists. Uh, a couple of these arguments uh, are very similar to arguments that we provide in, Christ in Christian apologetics. Uh, one of them, for example, the argument from beauty or the argument from design. Uh, a couple of points about Cicero uh, in relationship to John Calvin. When we, when we look at John Calvin and we discuss the sensus divinitatis, that uh, is taken directly from Cicero. And I don't have time to give the quotes right now. Uh, we know that John Calvin was heavily influenced by Cicero, and he took that notion of, of the, the sense of the divine from uh, Cicero's work, on the nature of the gods and used it. We could also discuss the Neoplatonists, uh, but we won't. We have so much more to talk about. So, if we go, to, if we turn towards early church fathers, uh, we find uh, in, for example, Aristides, one of the first Christian theologians, if not the first, to write a Christian apology. His work is called the Apology of Aristides. Uh, he was writing uh, around the years of 100 to 180. We're not 100% sure. Uh, we know he was a contemporary of Justin Martyr and was probably, his, his work was probably written prior to Justin Martyr's. Uh, in the beginning of his work, he presents what is essentially a form uh, of cosmological argument uh, presented as an enthymime, okay, which is essentially an argument from an unchanging or to an unchanging creator. Once he has demonstrated the existence of an unchanging creator uh, in his apology, he then uses that conclusion to reject all the other religions that are surrounding him at that time. And so he provides this, this really interesting uh, dilemma using multiple terms, all the different religions, and says, okay, we've proved from this argument that God is and that God is unchanging. Well, look at all of these religions. Polytheisms, all of these different polytheisms, such as Babylon, uh, Babylonian or, Chal uh, or, or Greek and so on, or and the others Egyptian. Well, in all of these religions, their gods are multiple and they are changing. Therefore, they, based upon our first demonstration, they are all false religions and, and so on. That's a very early uh, Christian use of natural theology to defend uh, the Christian doctrine of God. Uh, Justin Martyr. Also, a uh, philosopher who uh, presents arguments to demonstrate the existence of God, uh, Tertullian, often presented as the first fideist, uh, actually uh, present, suggests that there are many truths which can be known naturally from our observations of nature, uh, such as the existence of God, some divine attributes, the immortality of the soul, and the future judgment of man. And Tertullian thinks that all of those Doctrines can be known by natural knowledge. Athanasius is another one that's interesting. He provides a very in-depth argument, which is essentially an argument from beauty or from design uh, in his works, uh, for such as in Against the Heathens. I won't get into details on that either. Gregory Natsianzas in his work on theology uh, prevent, presents an argument which essentially sounds something like this. If there is order, then there is a rational cause that brought about that order. It is evident that there is order in the sensible universe. Therefore, there must be a rational cause that brought about that order. We find that in an argument worked out in his treatise on theology, which is amongst, which you'll be able to find amongst his five theological treatises. Gregory of Nyssa is also interesting. He presents arguments based upon beauty to demonstrate the existence of God. Uh, but he, he has this really interesting quote in his great catechism. In his great catechism, he explains uh, how, it, how we would present the truths of Christianity to different people from different backgrounds or with different uh, understandings of the world. 
He says this, and I give a quote. This is from the introduction or the preface to the great catechism. The method of recovery must be adapted to the form of the disease. You will not, by the same means, cure the polytheism of the Greek and the unbelief of the Jews as to the only begotten God. It is necessary, therefore, as I have said, to regard the opinions which the persons have taken up and to frame your argument in accordance with the error into which each has fallen by advancing in each discussion certain principles and reasonable propositions that thus, or in this way, through what is agreed upon on both sides, the truth may conclusively be brought to light. Well, what do we do with someone who does not believe in the existence of God? Gregory says this, should the person we're talking with say, there is no God, then from the consideration of the skillful and wise economy uh, organization and, and, and running of the universe, he will be brought to acknowledge that there is a certain overmastering power manifested through these channels or in this way. This is essentially, again, uh, he said he would basically say, if you're talking with someone who disbelieves in the existence of God, use an argument uh, based upon the design or order of the cosmos to demonstrate that God exists. So we've looked at here uh, all, all three, the first seven, the Greek Cappadocian fathers were Greek, it was Gregory Nazianz, Greek, Gregory of Nyssa, could have talked about Basil as well. Uh, Augustine. Augustine presents, and I've already mentioned uh, his interpretation of Psalms 19 and Romans. Uh, he, he, he presents in numerous places uh, the, the idea that pagan philosophers have indeed come to some knowledge of the existence of God. Uh, the most important he's for, for Augustine are uh, the Platonists. Now, there's plenty to say about Augustine. In fact, you could probably do an entire course just on natural theology in Augustine, looking at uh, his approach to knowledge. Uh, he, use, he uses a very Platonic uh, approach to understanding knowledge and metaphysics. However, he does say in his in his uh, in the city of God specific, specific as well that the Platonists have come to understand a number of truths about God. And uh, I don't know if I'm going to get the quote here for you, if, or, or if I should even take the time for that. Um, but he does think the Platonists know something about God that they came to know, truth, knowledge, truth of the knowledge about God. And in his, in some of his other works, he presents some very interesting arguments. Uh, one of them being uh, his work uh, on free will, where he presents an argument from truth to demonstrate the existence of God. All right, uh, who else do we have here? Uh, we could talk about Boethius in his Constellation of Philosophy, where he presents an argument based upon the organization of the, of the universe to demonstrate that God exists. Uh, we could talk about Anselm. Uh, he's most well known for his ontological argument. Uh, however, uh, if you read the Monologion, uh, he presents a number of different arguments to demonstrate the existence of God. Uh, some of them, one of them being based upon uh, the, uh, you might say, a hierarchy of goodness or being. So when he'll, he'll talk about whenever uh, something along the following lines. Whenever we make a comparison, uh, such as this is good, this is better, we're always referring to a standard. And then he's going to move that up to talk about the existence of God. He also presents an argument based upon being to demonstrate the existence of God. Uh, uh, we then have Thomas Aquinas. We're all aware of his five ways, uh, as well as uh, his argument from based upon the distinction between essence and existence to demonstrate the existence of God. Uh, Bonaventure, uh, in his the soul's book, The Soul's Journey into God, uh, not only adheres to the traditional interpretation that man, all men can know something about God uh, from the cosmos, but he also presents uh, essentially, essentially a similar argument to, to Augustine uh, to demonstrate uh, that God exists. And uh, in certain parts of the, the soul's journey into, into God, he will actually present numerous different arguments, one after the other, based upon different aspects of the human intellect to demonstrate that God exists. John Dunn Scotus has his own arguments. John Calvin, we've already mentioned his views on how we can demonstrate the existence of God. Uh, Martin Luther is, is, is one that's interesting because he's often taken to reject uh, natural theology. Um, he does, however, in some of his works, uh, discuss the relative use, for example, of natural law. Uh, also, if you go into the uh, Lutheran tradition, 
uh, we very early we find many references to natural law and natural theology in their works. Theodore Beza, in his commentary on the book of Job, says that natural theology is like a candle by which, which we are brought to the door of Christianity. Now, it's a candle, so it's a dim light, but it still opens the way for us to find the door by which we enter into Christianity. Peter Martyr Vermigli will make uh, similar distinctions about how God is known as we find in John Calvin's Institutes. So John Calvin talks about how God is known as creator uh, through nature and how he is known as savior through the scriptures. Uh, Peter Martyr Vermigli makes a similar distinction uh, talking about how God is known through creation and through scriptures. We could talk about Thomas Cranmer, uh, William Tyndale, John Davenant, uh, all of whom are, uh, Tom, Thomas Cranmer was an early Anglican uh, theologian, uh, all of whom uh, believed uh, that man was able to know something about uh, God from nature. Francis Turretin, he was actually uh, one of the uh, theologians who really got me interested in the Reformed approach to natural theology. I'll give you a quote from his Institutes of Atlantic Theology. He says, after he asked the question of whether or not the natural theology can be done or granted, he says, our controversy here is with the Socinians who deny the existence of any such natural theology or the knowledge of God. The Orthodox, on the contrary, uniformly teach that there is a natural theology, partly innate, derived from the conscience by means of common notions, and partly acquired. He also enumerates a number of arguments demonstrating the existence of God. Uh, all of the Puritan theologians, uh, with a couple minor exceptions, and I say minor, the minor exceptions only because they do not say anything about natural theology, positively or negatively, but every single Puritan theologian who says something about natural theology uh, says not only that it can be done, but that it's worth engaging in. One that's interesting is Stephen Charnock, uh, who says that natural theology uh, is important uh, for pastors who should use it as a remedy against um, essentially practical atheism, the what, act, acting as if God doesn't exist. And then I mentioned here the Reformed Confessions and Catechisms, uh, Cranmer's early catechism of the Church of England, the French Confession of, of Faith, the Belgian Confession, uh, and all the others, they all mention uh, the uh, natural theology. Now, I don't have a lot of time uh, to get into these objections. Uh, the objections are in some cases objections to natural theology on a, on a whole. Uh, in some cases, it's, it has to do with some aspect of natural theology. Uh, in some cases, it's just even a, sim a simple argument. But these are some of the objections that we might have. Uh, a number of these objections actually come from within Christianity uh, and are primarily within the last 100 to 200 years that they have come up. Uh, first of all, natural theology is man's attempt to attain to God without divine aid. Uh, I've, I've heard this uh, preached from a pulpit, uh, this, uh, this objection. This is simply a misunderstanding of what natural theology is. In fact, in the tradition of natural theology, uh, I'm, not, I, I'm not aware of many theologians who would say such a thing. In fact, the medieval theologians, the early patristics, and the reformed theologians of, of, the, of the Reformation period from 15 to 1700s, all of them would say that natural theology is sufficient to demonstrate that God exists and something of his attributes, but is insufficient to saving man. In fact, this is what Thomas Aquinas says in the first uh, uh, question uh, of the Summa Theologia. Uh, natural theology says nothing of the Trinity. Therefore, it says nothing of the true God. Now, this, in response to this, we could just go back to uh, the, the distinction I made between knowing that the artist exists and knowing who the artist is. But when we talk about the Trinity, we're talking about the persons of the, of, of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Natural theology tells us about the divine nature, not about the persons. It is not, therefore, false. Uh, if I know that something exists, but not yet who it is, my knowledge that the person exists is not false because I don't know who it is. If, I, uh, if I'm not expecting to see, for example, my brother walking down the, the, 
the driveway to my house because that would just be really weird. He shouldn't be there. And I don't recognize him. The fact that I know that someone is walking down the driveway to get to my house is not therefore false because I don't know who it is. Second, uh, introducing Greek or third, introducing Greek thought into natural theology. Well, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, this idea that uh, Greek thought was introduced into, into Christian theology has been soundly refuted in the past. Uh, and many uh, uh, commentators on the New Testament have noted uh, that uh, even the authors of the New Testament themselves were uh, in their culture uh, Hellenic. Uh, therefore, they, they themselves were introducing aspects of Greek thought into the scriptures themselves. And it's, it's, and it's not therefore wrong. Uh, and we can look at the others as well. None of the arguments demonstrate that God exists. We talk about the different, we'd have to look at the different arguments in each in, in detail. Um, natural theology is riddled with errors. The fact that there is one or two errors or even many errors does not therefore negate some of the truths which are discovered. And we'll leave the last one because I am out of time. So there's obviously a lot more that could be said. This was a brief summary of what natural theology is. Yes, there we go. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing with us and taking the time to speak to us regarding this. Um, and uh, also, I, I am aware also that it's natural theology is such a broad field um, and there's so many things that could be said. But uh, Lord willing, we can have you again in the uh, future and maybe we can go in and if also if our uh, listeners would also uh, enjoy it, uh, uh, to go into more of the particular things, yeah, of uh, the particular aspects of natural theology. But just, uh, yeah, thank you again uh, for for presenting that to us. So, for all those uh, in the, um, you know, uh, that are watching, uh, we're going to have a Q and A uh, session now, and so um, we're going to have some have some. Uh, I already have some questions coming through here. Uh, uh, um, David, I think you can uh, turn off uh, your screen sharing if, if you're done. There we go. Awesome. Great. So, um, okay, yeah, before, um, uh, let me just get to the questions. Okay, here we go. Um, we have a question here, one of our first questions here. Could you please briefly discuss the answer to objection number six <laughs> that you uh, discussed? So now you have the time to, to answer right. that objection. Yeah. Let me see here. Objection number six. The arguments are circular because they presuppose that God exists. Uh, let me, I, I should probably, hold on a second. I'll see if I can put that up so you can see it again. Um, share screen. Share. Okay. I don't know if it will, I hope this won't take me back through the entire thing. Anyways, you can see it there. Uh, the arguments are circular because they presuppose that God exists, or alternatively, they only demonstrate that God exists if you presuppose the truth of the Christian religion. Now, this is an argument that comes from within uh, Christian theology, specifically contemporary Christian theology. Uh, it's uh, we see it primarily in uh, Cornelius Van Til and uh, presuppositional thought. Uh, we will find variations of this in other uh, Christian theologians. Uh, I've found it uh, in the works of Alistair McGrath uh, as well, which I found personally quite interesting because in an early book that he wrote, uh, he actually had a, an appendix in which he attempted to provide uh, problems or a response to presuppositionalism. Uh, however, in some of his more recent work on natural theology, he has adopted an approach to natural theology, which is essentially uh, a form of uh, perspectivism or perspectivalism uh, in what we call it in philosophy. Uh, the idea of that uh, coming from a certain perspective is the only way in which natural theology actually works. So the arguments are circular because they presuppose that God exists. Well, it depends what we mean by presuppose. Uh, if we mean, technically the word presuppose means that we assume prior to, okay, suppose. It's where we're accepting something as true prior to something else. So I'll give you a quick example. Uh, in order to demonstrate from the scriptures that 
uh, Jesus is God, or uh, at least to demonstrate from the scriptures that if you if you are Christian, you have to have to affirm that Jesus is God. You must first assume uh, that the scriptures are the word of God. If they're not the word of God, I mean, you could still try and say that they affirm that Jesus is God, but it wouldn't really mean much of anything. It'd be like trying to say that, well, uh, you know, in Greek mythology, uh, Zeus is the highest God, and then I'll try and demonstrate it from those works. So there, there are certain assumptions that you want to make ahead of time. For example, if I, want to, if I want to say that the Bible is the word of God and that we should listen to it because it is God's word, I must first uh, presuppose that God exists. Um, that's what so I, I'm assuming ahead of time, the existence of God. Otherwise, the claim the Bible is the word of God makes no sense. So, a presupposition is a uh, idea, a thought, uh, 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 a, a truth claim that I hold as true prior to something else. That's the presupposition. To say that uh, the argument is circular because they presuppose that God exists would be to set, suggest that somewhere in the premises prior to the conclusion, there is this illicit premise somewhere hidden which says uh, that God exists. However, when we look at the arguments themselves, this is not the case. Uh, there is no illicit, at least we don't see one. I mean, you could try and put one in there, like, oh, there, there it is, you know, number one, God exists. Now let's, now let's prove that God exists. Rather, what would perhaps be uh, more in line with Christian theology, it would probably be better to say something along the following lines. The existence of God is a precondition for the possibility of, of human rationality. Okay? It's a precondition. If God does not exist, at least according to Christian theology, then uh, there won't be anything. Okay, God, if, and, and so there's this idea that unless God is, nothing else is. And that comes from the demonstration. We, we know that uh, from the demonstrations of the existence of God. Uh, we, or, or I'm, not, I'm not aware of any scriptures anyways that would, we could use to say that, but we could perhaps on other, other levels. So if we're going to talk about a precondition, that's one thing. A presupposition is something that's in my mind. So I, I would say that that is quite simply false on the level that, for example, uh, when you especially especially when you look at the early Greek philosophers, uh, Aristotle, Plato, Cicero, um, and so on, they don't seem to be presupposing the existence of God in their demonstrations. Rather, they seem to be arriving at them based upon uh, their observation of scripture uh, of the of the natural universe. Uh, I might add that when you arguments that were offered by Christian theologians throughout the history of Christian thought uh, to demonstrate the existence of God, if you look at the premises, they almost always begin with an observation about the created universe. Um, we, we look at the universe and we find it beautiful. Uh, we look at the universe and we find it ordered in general. Uh, we look at the, the universe and we see change, for example, uh, in, in Aquinas' first ways and other examples. These simple observations, which everybody would agree upon, at least for the most part, uh, are then used in reflections to ask to a certain extent, where, did, where does this come from? If we see change, what follows? If, if there's order, what follows? If there's beauty, what follows? And, and so on. So on the contrary, we're not presupposing that God exists. We're beginning with this, just, just a simple observation of the created cosmos. Okay. I see. Thank you, David. There's probably, there's a lot more that could be said, but. Yes. No, 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 it's good. Thank you so much. Um, let me see is, uh, if we have another uh, question here. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. David, you can, you can just turn your uh, sh uh, sharing off again when you're done. There, there we go. Um, Let's see. Uh, we have a question here. What role does beauty play in natural theology? How would the argument from beauty be phrased? Uh, so so um, that's an interesting question. I'm, so I'm teaching a course on uh, the argument from beauty in natural theology right now. We're, we're tracing it, it, it through history. Um, 
one of the things that we are seeing in this course that I'm teaching is that there isn't a single argument from beauty. There are in fact, a number of different arguments from beauty. Each one of, this, of them is different. Um, and th they're based upon different types of observations. Uh, so some of them, uh, we could call them the, we might say it's the Ciceronian, the Ciceronian uh, argument from beauty. Uh, because we find it, I think, probably for the first time in Cicero, uh, this would be a, something along the lines of uh, when we observe uh, beauty, we uh, recognize that that beauty is put there by uh, an artist. We observe beauty in the rational world. Uh, therefore, there must be an artist who brought the rational world or the, sorry, the sensible world into existence. Now, that, that's a really simplified um, version of the Ciceronian argument. And we find that uh, uh, type of argument all throughout the literature uh, from the time of Cicero uh, all the way right up even to uh, um, uh, Francis, Francis Turretin uh, and, and other uh, even uh, more contemporary thinkers, that type of an argument. Uh, I will say that once we hit the modern period, of thought and into the contemporary period, that a form of argument uh, ends up transforming into a design argument where we no longer talk about beauty per se, but design. And I think one of the reasons for that uh, is that uh, there is a change in the way that people in modern and contemporary time understand beauty. Now, another form of the argument from beauty uh, is based in uh, a more of a platonic approach. Uh, and so we will have this platonic approach to beauty where beauty is a form and anything that, and, and so in, uh, I'll kind of say this right off the start, start, this argument will hold if platonic metaphysics is true. If, if we refute platonic metaphysics, the platonic argument from beauty is less compelling at least. Uh, and so the idea for, for Plato would be Beauty is a form. Anything in the natural world that's, that we see as being beautiful necessarily has the form of beauty. And so from the observation of the natural world and the existence of the form of beauty in things, we are therefore brought to recognize the existence of the divine uh, form of beauty. And then in the Neoplatonic thought, that form of divine beauty, which is just a form in the realm of the forms with Plato, it actually gets changed into uh, God himself, who is the supernal or supreme beauty. Okay. And so there's that approach. Now that argument will get slightly modified by Augustine and then later by Bonaventure uh, to become an argument almost based upon the existence of essences and specifically the, the essence of beauty. Uh, Plotinus will in fact say that this argument, the argument from beauty is so compelling because beauty uh, draws our attention. It, it, it's, it's kind of like, when you, it's like uh, going to a circus. It's, it's flashing colors and it's just like, wow, it's, just, it's, ev it's everywhere. You know, or, or you're sitting outside and you see the sunrise, you know, the sun setting, uh, it draws your attention. And so beauty draws us to it. That's why it's uh, in Pl Pl Platonic thought and Plotinian thought, beauty is this um, powerful way of drawing our mind away from the sensible world to the divine. Uh, and then of course there, was, there are other forms of it. Uh, I, I could keep going if you want me to. Uh, the conclusion of most of these arguments, um, in the case of the Ciceronian style, it's there is therefore a divine artificer or artist, okay? Uh, but in the other ones, which are more Neoplatonic in style, uh, the, the conclusion will be more along the lines of, there is therefore a divine or supreme beauty, and that's what we mean by God, okay? Uh, so again, these arguments are not demonstrating in any way, shape, or form that God is triune, but that the divine nature is this way, or that there is a divine artificer. There's, again, there's more that could be said, but I, I don't know if I want to yes. jump into all of that. 
Yeah, no, but uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, David. I think uh, it really uh, sums it up uh, quite well. Yes, thank you. Um, we have another question here. Uh, how would one best go about helping followers of the New Age, the New Age movement, uh, who believe that nature itself is God, to take the next step and look at the all, cre the all creating God? So, you know, how to change the perspective from that nature itself is God to the fact that nature is a revelation of a God that created it. Yeah. That's an awesome question. Um, that's actually a question that I'm uh, currently working on myself uh, in, the, in the sense that um, there are some very interesting arguments, okay, that can be given to demonstrate uh, and, and, we've, we, and we find them in, in Aristotle, we find them in Plotinus, you know, in many Greek philosophers and also Christian philosophers, these arguments that can be given to demonstrate that God is other than the sensible cosmos. And those arguments would be sufficient to demonstrate that no, created nature itself is not God. They were created by God. Um, so I, I think that I, I would put it this way, philosophically speaking, there are some really solid arguments that we can use we can maybe that, that could be maybe a, a different subject for a different conference because there's a lot of issues to get we need to get into to explain them. Um, however, uh, for, for me, what I find personally interesting about that question is yeah, but um, it's all well and good to have these nice philosophical arguments. But when you're talking with someone who is involved in the new age, the reality is arguments don't make a big difference. They don't care so much about the philosophical arguments. Uh, and so one of the questions that I'm personally wondering about is how, in fact, uh, not just in theory, as in philosophical argument, but how, in fact, do you uh, bring someone who is involved in the new age uh, from the view that the cosmos is God to the, to the idea that God transcends the cosmos? Uh, that, I find, is much more difficult. Um, the philosophical arguments work uh, but on the personal level, uh, it's much more, it, it's, it's, uh, it's much more difficult because they don't often accept arguments. Uh, one of the things that I might suggest, and I'm toying with this myself is getting them to read, uh, Augustine's confessions, uh, because Augustine asks those questions. He specifically turns to the created cosmos and says, are you the God that I've loved that I discovered in the created universe? And the cosmos replies, no, I'm not. Uh, and so there's this, he, he suggests, Augustine is suggesting on a personal level, no, there, there, there is this tem testimony from the created universe that says we are not the God that you love. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think there's, uh, that you'll also find arguments in Thomas Aquinas's works, uh, which will show that. And Aristotle, in fact, the section I quoted from Aristotle's metaphysics uh, uh, is states uh, at least, uh, and you'll find the arguments for it in the metaphysics that um, God transcends the sensible universe. He, he is more than the sensible universe. Yes. But I can't okay. go into much more detail. It, it just takes too much time. Yes, 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 yes. Well, that, that could maybe be uh, a, a talk in the future. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, David. Uh, we have another uh, question here. In what way is uh, natural theology related to natural law theory? Okay, um, I think that one's fairly, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. I've had people ask that before. I, I think it's uh, fairly um, straightforward in the following sense. Uh, natural theology is that which you can know about the divine nature. Natural law is uh, what you can understand about uh, morality. So when you're looking at natural law, you're asking the question, what is the good of man? When you're looking at natural theology, you're asking, uh, where did the universe come from? First, oh, it came from God. What is God like? Second, so you're looking at the existence and properties in act or existence and attributes of God in natural theology. In natural law, you're looking at human morality. Mm. In both cases, it's uh, this rational, it's, it's, it's an, I would call it a re reflective observation of nature so you're looking at the sensible universe you're looking at what man is and then you're asking the question that uh, based on what man is 
what should he be doing? And then in natural theology, where did this universe come from and what would its cause be like? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um, another one we have here. Uh, can you maybe briefly expand on the concept of common notions? What is it? What role does it play in natural theology and so on? So just like when you mentioned the, uh, the common notions, yeah, the aspect of common notions. Uh, I'm going to punt that one, actually, uh, to um, J.V. Fesco, who just recently came out a book in which he discusses that. Uh, I, I assume that the reference that, that the, question, the questioner is, is making is to the quote from Francis Turretin on common notions. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just going to say, you know what, you want to have a good discussion on that? Read J.V. Fesco's book that, he, that just came out. I believe it's called Reformed Apologetics. Mm. And he will be, okay. that will go much more into detail than I could do in, in attempting to answer anything here. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, also, as a, uh, a question of like uh, practicality and what you said, like natural theology can, uh, we can like, for example, get the attributes of God uh, from na uh, natural theology. Could you give an example uh, of how, how does one even demonstrate that? Not that it's possible. But like, how do you demonstrate uh, the attributes of God? You can maybe can pick like an attribute and just show how through natural uh, theology, how did, do you get there? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll premise this by saying this is going to be summary. And therefore, if the argument's not uh, perfectly mm -hmm. uh, presented, please forgive me. I'm giving it in a, in a brief answer. Uh, essentially, Aquinas's first way uh, is... Uh, not only demonstrates that God exists, but that God is also impassable. The, he begins with change, and he says, we, we observe, the, the, the eyes or the, you know, the senses attest that some things change. And then he says, if something changes, it's changed by another. Okay, uh, if, if that thing is changed, then it is changed by another. There's a lot of details that we would have to go into, go into there to make to understand what's going on, but that, that was some of the premises. Uh, he says then, but this uh, series of uh, moved movers or changed changers cannot go on ad infinitum. It can't go on to infinity. This is not a, a movement forward, it's a movement backwards, okay? Uh, you, you've got the, the move, you might say, I, I guess it's hard to give an example on television. Uh, here we go, here we go. Let's, let's say this mouse is sitting on a desk uh, I'm moving it across. Well, it is in this, as it's being moved, it's being moved. It's, it is being moved. What's moving it? My hand. You know, what's moving the, my hand? You know, my arm, right? And so on and so forth. Uh, well, he, he's going to add, this movement cannot go on ad infinitum. We must come, uh, we, we must therefore come to a, a first unmoved mover. Okay. Well, that statement, that first unmoved mover uh, if we rephrase that, he's saying uh, we come to a cause of change that is immutable. There's our first uh, attribute of God. God is immutable. Okay? And that's part of the conclusion of the first way. Um, we could then, go, in, in fact, in each of the, each of the five ways, uh, it comes to a different conclusion. And in that conclusion, there is the next thing. But let's say we stick with immutable, okay? Mm -hmm. We can then go a step further. We've demonstrated there is a first immutable mover. Okay, well, what does immu immutable mean? To be immutable means that you do not change or there, there is, you, you cannot in any way be changed. Okay, can we demonstrate something more? Sure. What is time? At least in Aristotelian Thomistic thought, and again, we can jump into a whole debate about what time is, but at least in Aristotelian Thomistic thought, and we're looking at Aquinas, so we can, we can use this, uh, time is the measure of movement or of change, okay? So if there's no change, then that thing which is unchanged or immutable is also, therefore, a temporal outside of time, not measured by time. Well, how do we express that in theology? Eternal. So from the first, first way of Thomas Aquinas, we've demonstrated not only that there is a first mover, that that first mover is immutable, but that, that we, we can then go on to demonstrate from that conclusion that God is also eternal. And we could, we could keep going. So that, that's, again, really quick, 
I, you know, I, I didn't even attempt to give a formally valid uh, presentation of the first way. I just tried to give a, a quick outline of what it, what it, what it looks like. And, and the conclusion being that there was a first immutable mover, first attribute yeah. of God, and we can go on. Yes. Yeah, it's just interesting. I um, just did on, on expanding that point. It's just something that I, I read. I'm, I still want to read more and getting into it to understand it. But it's like, uh, 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 I can't remember the paper now, but the author spoke about how the five ways of Thomas Aquinas are not just like an apologetic. They establish sort of like theological uh, attribute, well, categories in the sense of like getting the attributes. It sets up a whole system. Yep. in that way, uh, yep. a system, yeah, so the theology proper, basically, yeah. Okay, yes, exactly, awesome. and if you, and for the people who are listening, if they want to actually pursue that further, they can jump into the, the, the first, I think it's 90 questions of the Summa Theologiae, and, and look at how Aquinas uh, discusses the different attributes of God, and, and how he's drawing these links, these, 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 a link between the different attributes, from one attribute he demonstrates another. And then from, maybe from the same attribute, he de demonstrates another attribute. And then from this attribute, he de demonstrates another and so on. Uh, and it's quite interesting to see how he develops those arguments. Yes, yes. And so uh, on that, I think this uh, will be our, our last que uh, question. Uh, I want to be mindful of, uh, of your time. Um, so if you could recommend any books for anyone, you know, regardless of what their view now is on everything we said tonight and stuff like that. Um, like where, where can people get material? And it's like, what books can you recommend for people who want to further read about natural theology? That's a good question. There, there are so many, uh, <laughs> there are so many books out there, actually. It's, uh, it's almost embarrassing to, 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 to know that we have so many resources on the subject. Uh, it, I guess it really depends on uh, the academic level of the person who, who's looking. Let's say you want to, yeah. if you're looking for an introduction to natural theology, you've never really got into this before. Um, there are, um, I guess, there are a couple, there are a couple books that you could look at, I suppose. It's funny. I'm not, I actually can't think of anything on an, on an introductory level uh, that I would uh, point anyone towards. Um, one book that I have found really helpful is uh, Biblical Faith and Natural Theology by James Barr. Uh, this was a, a lecture uh, that he gave, uh, a Gifford lecture on natural theology. Uh, one of the interesting things about this book is that it's looking at the uh, natural theology in the scriptures. It's, it's written by a man who is a biblical exegete by, uh, by training, uh, and specifically in theology, uh, Barthian. Barthian. Uh, and now everyone knows if they know anything about Karl Barth, uh, he was very much against natural theology. Uh, and uh, James Barr essentially accepted the Barthian approach uh, to natural theology. Uh, however, uh, his study of scripture brought him to reject uh, the Barthian approach. And in the work, Biblical Faith and Natural Theology, he actually goes and shows how uh, natural theology undergirds the entire scriptures and is used not only in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament as well. It's actually quite interesting. Um, I could, you know, this might be a, a shameless uh, um, uh, uh, you know, giving, offering that something that I, I, I've worked on. Um, you can look at some of the, the more recent book that I wrote without excuse. There are a couple articles in there on natural theology. Uh, the notes that I was using for the presentation today are a close to being finished introduction uh, to natural theology, which will, I hope, uh, be as helpful as the work that uh, Andrew and I put together on natural law, uh, just to introduce the subject to help people kind of get into it and, and know where to turn for other resources. Uh, mm -hmm both contemporary and historical if and then and, and that's where i guess you could come to questions of uh, other other types of resources if you're going to look at uh you know, the natural theology perhaps in the early greek ph uh, philosophers you want to you you want to get hold of uh, Werner jaeger's uh important book the theology of the early greek philosophers um and uh cicero 
Uh, you might want to look at his uh, On the Nature of the Gods. It's quite good. Uh, and he has uh, a section in there where he discusses the existence of God. Uh, and then, of course, you can just go through the history of uh, theologians, uh, look at how they, and, and just read the different church fathers, uh, read, uh, I, I love recommending Gregory Nazianzus's uh, small treatise called On Theology. It's just, it's an absolutely wonderful read. Uh, again, it's not an introduction to natural theology per se, but you find it in there, uh, arguments for the existence of God, and it's very devotional. Uh, you could look at works by Athanasius and so on and so forth. There's, there, there is a wealth of resources um, so maybe a good place to start as well might be uh, the Oxford Handbook, handbook to uh, Natural Theology or the, I think it's called the Blackwell uh, Handbook to Natural Theology. They yeah, also the have helpful resources. Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology. That yeah. Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology. Yeah. Those will include basically articles by different uh, scholars on the subject. Uh, another one that's it's quite interesting. I, I don't see it quoted as, as often as it should be. Uh, the Reformed Objection, I believe it is. The Reformed Objection to Natural Theology. Um, oh, his name's not coming to me. Uh, the, uh, name, the author's name. I have it sitting on my bedside table. Uh, it, that is, all, I, I could send you that by email maybe, and you could put that in the comments if you want or, or pass it on yes. to anybody. Uh, Thank, that you. Is, Thank you. That, that's a, a helpful look at how natural theology has been received in Reformed theology uh, specifically uh, contemporary Reformed theology. Uh, yeah, and, and again, like, I, if we're looking at historical stuff, I can just list off a whole list of different yes. yeah. uh, Reformed theologians as well. But yeah, yeah, maybe maybe what we also can do, you could maybe just send like a uh, bibliography list that summarizes. We can just post it in our description after uh, tonight's YouTube stream. Then people can go and look. Uh, uh, have a look at um, the potential resources, yes. Yes, absolutely. There's also a book on the Puritans, uh, Natural Theology and the Puritans, I believe it is, uh, which is quite good, uh, looking at, uh, again, the Puritans' approach to natural theology. Yes, definitely. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, David, and thank you for your time that uh, you took to share with us and uh, come and speak with us all. We really appreciate it. And also, uh, I want to also thank uh, say thank you to uh, Gior as well, helping us with the technology. Always uh, thankful uh, um, for uh, his help uh, with that. And uh, yeah, so that will be uh, our conclusion to tonight's live stream, folks. And so, uh, yeah, hopefully um, we will see you again, Lord willing, next week uh, when we shall uh, continue our live stream. And uh, yes, uh, be blessed and uh, may God be with you all. Thank you and have a good night. Thank <laughs> you.